Professor Margaret Beale Spencer is the Charles F. Gray Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Comparative Human Development and the college with and the college and is the Marshall Field Fourth Professor of Urban Education at the University of Chicago. A developmental psychologist, she is also an alumni alumna of the Committee on Human Development at the University of Chicago. Before we train Chicago, she will be endowed with an overseas professor and director of the Interdisciplinary Studies of Human Development Program and faculty member in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Spain, Psychology and Education Division. Additionally, she is the director of the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Health Achievement, Neighborhood Growth, and Ethnic Studies Changes, and also guided by Adams in all of the effort the WEB Du Bois Collective Research Institute. Guy and noted efforts in continuing, continuing to frame our scholarship. Professor Spencer's phenomenological bearing of ecological systems theory, PBS, provides an identity focused cultural ecological perspective, which frames a gender, race, culture, and context, acknowledging the program of human development research. Recognizing the universality of human variability, the theory addresses resiliency, identity, and competence formation. Positive for the growth of humans situated both in the United States and abroad. Having authored over 140 scholarly publications, edited several volumes, and provided congressional testimony in the nation's capital, Margaret Bill Spencer was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, 2019. She is the recipient of the 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Psychological Association, the Division 7. Development Science 2018, we brought the Journal of Work of Senior Contributions to Development Science, and the Society for Research and Child Development for Work of Senior Contributions to Cultural and Ecological Research. Professor Mark Bill Spencer's scholarship has been generated from dozens of grants submitted by foundations and federal funding, submissions as well as an ABC, CNN program broadcasted internationally. Dr. Lindsay, thank you, Professor Mark Bill Spencer. Mr. Taylor here, this microphone, so we're up here. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Hobson, for the valued introduction. Just appreciate it. I'll begin uh, by sharing my sincere appreciation for the opportunity to provide a distinguished lecture at the College of Education, University of Illinois, at a grand education. I am deeply honored to really thank you. On multiple levels, the current period is a pregnant moment. It's a pregnant moment of opportunity for our nation and the world, as well as a period of much a continuing challenge as well. I plan to provide a particular perspective concerning a few uncomfortable 21st century realities, including why there is a continuing resistance to diversity goals, inclusion requirements, and equity necessities. In fact, I have looked forward to sharing and being in conversation with you as a community of admired scholars who are collectively sharing why a radical interrogation of law and perspectives is absolutely needed for the collective thriving of diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly as we move into the 21st century. In fact, uh, when I uh, queried about your expectations for today's visit, my assistant um, reported feedback that a goal for today's lecture and my visit was to respond to the query as to whether diversity, inclusion, and equity will die. Instead, I wish to share a particular perspective that will aid in emboldening us about DEI. That is, as opposed to remaining on the defensive, I believe our science as practice traditions provide the scaffolding for offensive strategies. As a reminder of the perceptions that I have of you, I've invited um, Amy Summers to hand out a little memento, a little memento or symbolic reminder about today's conversation about DEI and who we are as engaged scholars and what we can do both singularly and collectively to instigate further positive change in order to keep nine goals. In other words, I have no interest in talking about death. Alternatively, mm -hmm. my interest is in DPI's thriving. Mm -hmm. 
you will know that the tool keepsake is good enough uh, for a wallet or to be tucked into a makeup case. My basic goal is that you may keep it tucked away but available for massaging as a reminder when you are sitting in a decision making table at particular times when your voice and perspective are especially needed. I believe the exercise will provide the reminder needed for bringing attention to things especially important to DEI. In other words, don't wimp out on me. All right? The perspective scaffolding our remarks today is that a particular viewpoint has been ignored in DEI conversations. The shortcoming continues to have implications for the science produced, its use in training professionals for providing intended social supports, and it has been redundantly reproduced as policies that have not provided the efficacy promised. Instead, their views have further supported stereotyping and fueled power negotiations that further disenfranchise those for whom culturally sensitive, developmentally, and socially relevant supports are needed for all setting long term harm. The position taken is that our social science machinery has consistently failed to acknowledge the humanity of communities of color. The short sightedness produces unacknowledged character virtue shortcomings. For social scientists and education researchers operating within a knowledge generating and disseminating professional context, failing to acknowledge that humanity perspectives are not used for those marginalized as, as, as the others matters as a function of race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and other categories of difference and intersectionality, the underlying assumption of dehumanization makes a huge impact. That is functioning as a research tradition and, and as cultural practices, the research designed, generated, interpreted, and utilized as practice and policy then reinforce stereotypes given their ineffectiveness to show all efficacy for all setting harm as a function of historical dehumanizing practices. Thus, this presentation towards the position that character virtue is not only a theme imposed as moral development research, and like that other people, and other people, their children. As well, it requires application within social science research and practice traditions and has been described by uh, Duterres and others uh, as stable repertoires of practice. So problematically, practice traditions within our social science traditions persistently represent people of color and things about difference in problematic and deficit-assuming ways. The failing reinforces resistance then to diversity, inclusion, and equity goals. The dilemma is that differences are conceptualized as deficits, thus persistently suggesting stereotypes of less than equal status. So the conceptual shortcoming that represents, let's go there, 20 to 22 intergenerationally communicated social practices and science traditions given Blacks' arrival to Virginia 400 years ago. The representation of diversity by the social sciences as leadership practices, and we are all leaders, fails to acknowledge the reality of this deficit assuming social science culture. The critique to be presented today for your consideration and ideally for some discussion underscores the failure to acknowledge your comings evident as stable, scholarly practices. As noted, the reference practices have to do with ignoring the fact of shared humanity. And moving forward, I'll provide an analysis of the shortcoming frame from phenomenological variant of ecological systems theory framing, generally referred to as PEMIS. And as well, I will call into conversation the role of character virtue. The implicating character virtue concerns acknowledges that science is in a state of continual revision and updating but must as well function with a conscience. In this approach, treating knowledge as capital, this presentation acknowledges individual and collective research practices that may inadvertently contribute to the concerns about DEI. 
The deliverance of our own of our own contributions to problematic practices was driven home recently by an editorial in the journal Science. The editor in chief, um, Ho uh, uh, Holden Thorpe, noted the following, and I quote: "The process of science is one of continual revision, but it's also one that must have a conscience." He wrote that editorial in response to the fact of the year of the transistor and acknowledging that Shockley was one of the co-inventors of the transistor. And let's be clear, the transistor is, it represents almost the silicon in Silicon Valley. That's how important it was. But um, Holder's, um, Holder Thorpe's editorial also acknowledged the fact in terms of conscience is that yes, Shockley was a co-inventor of the of the uh, transistor, which underscored everything that's happening to happening in Silicon Valley, but he was a new genesis. And we can't ignore that fact. So conscience matters. So under acknowledged cultural ways of learning and doing science are impactful. They suggest cultural practices that can act as harmful science traditions and scaffolding for policy relevant practices. So more to the point, these traditions have consequences for the resistance that we all experience and know about in terms of diversity, inclusion, and equity goals. Thus they have implications for whether diversity, inclusion, and equity goals die or in fact are embraced. What I am checking is that each of us has a role to play in the success of diversity, inclusion, and equity values. My viewpoint is that our contributions are linked to how we approach our science. That is inadvertently continuing the practice of contributing to science and to science tradition, that others' differences promotes a context of marginalization, dehumanization, stereotyping, and problematizing. So the under so this under interrogated exercise a scaffold dehumanizing beliefs about those considered other. And my deep point is that new ways of thinking about shared humanity is needed. As an exemplar of the noted shortcoming, please recall that in another eight months, we will celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education decision, 1954. And it is unnecessary to remind ourselves that in many places across our nation, conditions are as dire for children of color today as was the case when the Brown decision was offered as the remedy for offsetting the harm imposed by that by those conditions. So what I'd like to do very quickly in terms of just sharing uh, this perspective is go through a like, group of slides and I was thinking about this, you know, it was important that I simply go to the individuals who talking about these things for a long time, and that's study the voice. And so one of his messages that always said was that we really don't know a lot of knowledge. You know a lot of stereotypes, but not knowledge about people of color. And that we're not thinking appropriately about race. And I would add to the voices to this uh, uh, quote is that in too many instances, we still refuse to think more appropriately about the humanity of people of color. So, of course, given the history of Brown, you know, we know uh, that in fact, uh, the Clark's work was used as the footnote 11. But what's important about in terms of how we misuse social science, what they used in the Clark's work you know, was not developmentally sensitive in terms of the implications of it for different developmental periods, number one. And number two, because I interviewed Clark uh, when he was at um, Morehouse doing his stint, you know, most importantly for him, because, you know, he was this angry man. I'm rather pissed myself, actually. Um, he, he, they did not include his research that spoke to the, in, the impact of those conditions of segregation, et cetera, on white youngsters as well. So here we are 70 years later, when the information was there, but it was not used because why? The Supremes had their own assumptions about the problem, and the problem was black and brown bodies. 
So what I can say to you is, oh, uh, my thing, it's working. So what I can say to you is that yes, they did the research, but in terms of our role as leaders, is not just the conduct of the research. It's making sure that the interpretations of the research are not weaponized against those for whom we're supposed to support. Are you following me? So we have a responsibility, not just in terms of conscience, uh, but also in terms of interrogating, okay, and uh, interrogating the findings. So what these slides do is to basically describe that for the subsequent uh, years after the ground studies, uh, studies, and here yeah, and also clinical observations, that the data were pretty much the same, but what we were able to demonstrate subsequent to the Clark's work is that we were not taking into account uh, people's humanity, that is children's cognitive development, children's socio-emotional functioning, developmentally that can be separate from their ways of knowing. So all these nuanced understandings about human development of kids of color, we've evolved, if you will, uh, research uh, contributed to as well, so in the interim, uh, but still, there are so many stereotypes that people use as data, as opposed to authentic understanding that we know about difference. So uh, these studies basically have shown um, that uh, children who are developing in context, it is the context that may deliver, if you will, messages that given their developmental period may or may not be internalized. Kids are smart. They tell you what they're exposed to. Kids are very smart, they tell you what they're exposed to. But when kids are very young, those messages may not be internalized, they simply tell you what they hear, what they hear about the adults say, what they observe when they navigate space, but they may not internalize those ideas. So we've been able to basically you know, do a lot of uh, good research during the interim of 20 years since the Brown decision, uh, but there's still, you know, people make careers off of pathologizing. I mean, certainly uh, this notion of John Agro's Aborium in terms of acting white uh, was just one of those, if you will, uh, the first science study that was misused, was misused uh, to further, if you will, the othering of certain individuals, right? But the bottom line is that we think about young people, white kids, black kids, doesn't make a difference. Kids have a need to show that they're all of that bag of chips, that they're super, right? And so when someone is different, you want to feel better, you put them down in some way. But it's not science, it's adolescent and middle childhood behavior. Are you following me? But part of the problem here is that there is a decision, there is a choice to misuse information. Uh, so this goes on in terms of differences, you know, there are always, you know, ways of being creative and cute. You know, talking about bananas or talking in terms of Asian American kids or Oreos or whatever, but they're simply child behavior. They're child or adolescent behavior, but should not be taken to say, to say something about the ego processes, okay, of people at particular developmental periods. So my point here is that social science is powerful, but we need to have some responsibility and show it that the conscience in terms of how we use them. So we got away, you know, uh, when Rob Rowe started publishing his studies, uh, you know, again, talking about the context. Well, we as social scientists are part of the context, right? So it was helpful that he developed an ecological system theory, but we knew better even before Rob Rowe began uh, publishing. Now, uh, before Rob, there was Rob Rowe, there were ecological uh, scientists who uh, were part of the Kansas tradition. And uh, this is urban right, et cetera. These are folks who create to look at and say, uh, just a very experience and when it has contact, makes a difference for who you're not. What we've been able to do, uh, basically, uh, 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 adding to the work from EFT and from the early ecological uh, psychologists, again, emphasizing this perspective of human development process be experienced by everyone, including people of color. That you basically lean on some of the more philosophical perspectives about what happens, what the, the processes of biological changes, the social changes, the cognitive changes, what does that mean for how, how kids make sense of the world? So we added in this work uh, the importance of emphasizing phenomenological problems, and that is given these human development processes. 
together, what do they mean for young people in terms of our research, right? And how and, and how do we interpret it? So PDAT came out of the need uh, to integrate the domain of human development uh, and to basically generate a theory uh, that take into account how people make sense of things. So we already have data from special psychology in particular that just talks about uh, independent of what one people shortcoming is. We know that blind people, we know that people have different kinds of, if you will, developmental uh, issues, they still make meaning of life, right? So even if you can't, you know, you can't hear, you can't see, you have a way of understanding the world, you make sense of it. And that determines what you do next. So, so uh, what we were able to do is to, you know, approach human development uh, for diverse people of color by acknowledging uh, their symptoms that work at the same time. Let me give you an example. I know that some of you may, may focus on, say, cognitive development in terms of the language or whatever, or, or if it's clinically focused on ego processes, or if you're more biologically or science oriented, you may look at the biological. But the bottom line is all these systems work together. And for youngsters of color in particular, that system, that intersectionality of their domains of functioning deserve consideration. They deserve good research in order to understand how they impact what comes next. And the example I was sharing this morning uh, with colleagues with whom I had breakfast is that I have to have a 15-year-old grandson who um, grew uh, five inches in each of two nine-month periods. So at 15 years old, new 15-year-old, he now stands at six four, And obviously he's not finished yet. And so the issue is then for him, you know, these uh, these biological processes really matter. So, uh, so my retirement, I want to know how he's handling all this. You know, how he's handling the fact that, you know, he needs shoes every few weeks. Yeah. You know, he's made a lot of stuff like that. Other kids want to get Nikes, they look good. He needs to get Nikes because his toes are tight. So, what I'm is to say, these human development processes are in place for kids of color as well. But in terms of how we do our research and how we interpret it. Those findings, very right, well, often they don't consider this sort of a systems way of thinking about other people's children. So what we know with that in terms of in terms of how these three domains of functioning work together, we know that we as social scientists have to think about culturally appropriate, developmentally sensitive ways of designing supports. Because if we don't use research in our thinking in this way, that means that here we're, we're misusing research. We're trying to design supports that may not make a difference. The supports have to make sense. And that's especially for individuals who, who represent you know, a history of lots of risk, lots of challenges, and not a lot of supports that make sense, like the Brown decision. Okay, we get that. Okay, so this is where we've been. Oh, this is where we've been in our science. We basically, number one, assume that vulnerability means risk and that we've done our social science in very, in very linear ways. We've looked at vulnerability as risk and then we've looked at outcomes. You know, you know what this guarantees? That guarantees you another publication. <laughs> That's all that it does. This, this linear, if you will, relationship here I mean, even my four or five year old grandchild knows this. If you have certain you know, difficulties here, you're going to have this. And our, our linearity dependent statistical packages allow for us to get a 0 0.001 for that relationship. So, how so it's not going to be very helpful. That's my point. So, what we've done in terms of PDEF is that we're sort of providing, if you will, I know your, your eyes are glazing over. It's okay, I understand. But for those of you used to this, please help your name. The bottom line is that we are critiquing. This is how we've done business. And too often we've emphasized the risk as opposed to uh, the product, reproductive factors. So the important thing about uh, a PS perspective or something like it 
is that we acknowledge the human vulnerability of everybody. So when you think about, for example, uh, the uh, Proud Brothers and all these other right-wing uh, groups, their vulnerability level is different because the risk for them would have to do with an uninterrogated self in terms of privilege as capital, the whiteness as privilege and capital, right? And so therefore diversity for them may mean having to share opportunities that they took for granted, are you following me? So what vulnerability means for certain communities may be different for other communities. But how, uh, but given Rebecca's here, given how we think about um, policies, we need policies that respond to the diversity of our young people. Because young people have different experiences. Some are, if you will, uh, eventful, okay, and dissonant, and others have been pretty consonant, right? So the consonant even, you know, prevents one from having to, uh, having less practice dealing with challenge. Mm -hmm. If you're living in a state of consonance, you don't have to practice adaptive coping methods. Mm -hmm. So trying to overturn the government on January 6th, that's something very different for you. Are you following it? So we need empathy for everybody. We need to see everybody's point of view and therefore be able to design strategies that make sense for everybody's children, given the history that remains uninterrogated and the same has had this way. Okay, we'll continue. We won't go there. <laughs> okay, so for me, this has been the simple publication guarantee what question. Vulnerability level, I mean, look at some outcome. This is what social science has been for the last 50 years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not using my conscience and tell the truth. You need to give me a little feedback here. I don't think I'm off on that. Mm -hmm. People have made very productive careers with three, four hundred publications, okay, with this linear association. Like I said, my five year old granddaughter would get. This is the what. If we're going to design appropriate supports, it is the how that's important. It is the how that we have to investigate. So what we have done is that we say, part of our humanity, we need to understand, given vulnerability and level differences, you know, how much risk I have in this situation for the protective factors, I would experience some stress, right? Okay? Uh, that Dr. Jared, we have this conversation, my solution here, he knows that we're going to experience some stress, right? Because we have the normal path that we have to meet. If you mercy wants to be a diversity, technology, and inclusion task, right? We call it some dissonance. We want that difference to be left. If you want to understand what are the, if you will, challenges to it. Because otherwise, the threat becomes too great and very long and trickles down to us. All right, so therefore, listen to our question. And then all the idea is to have support to diminish some of the threat. And when you're in the threat, in my position, I want to have some adaptive, if you will, supports here to keep kids from engaging in maladaptive as an adaptive solution as we have to cope. Why? Because everybody has the same developmental task. Just because you're a kid of color, it doesn't mean your expectations are more different. We expect success. If you don't get it, we're going to check you off as failed. Hello? That makes no sense. So that is adaptive for happens. Developmental tasks are the same. The support are not the same, and so are tech. The 400 years of history, 22 generation opportunities have not worked. Okay? So we need supports that make sense to make sure that in these developmental tasks, there are adaptive coping methods. I'm going to go through a, a couple in a second uh, just to give you some exemplars. And what's important about these reactive coping methods is that it means them that they become internalized as identities. Identities ideally positive. So what did Erickson tell us from my clinical colleagues? Erickson told us, and I and I I this I buy, even that's like one of the oriented theory, is that even uh, having an identity, these ego processes are so baseline and it's, they're so important that even having a maladaptive and negative identity is better than having none. May I repeat that again? 
or one psychological integrity, having an identity, even if it's negative, is better than having none at all. And therefore, that is why the system looks this way. It is not a linearity set of experiences. Our lives are not like the best time we are. Our very biology is a system, right? So we need to acknowledge that and know that once you have one or the other linked to some developmental period and you have particularly, uh, you know, framed, if you will, outcomes, whatever you're measuring at the time, as you are rolling across the life course, that's going to increase your level of vulnerability and balance or imbalance between risk and protective factors. That means those other productive outcomes linked to that negative identity, linked to those maladaptive way of coping with the stress of developmental tasks. You define the future and you've made somebody's career. I'm going to tell you that. Okay, so there's these issues are especially relevant uh, when you come to particular communities of uh, an individual and black boys in particular. And I had a you know interest in black boys development for a long time, probably in the interest of transparency. I was I would say growing up at the units of three girls that are having brothers, I was always interested. I felt the guys were kind of interested. <laughs> as much more of a you know uh, bio um, and uh, you know, more uh, physical science uh, person, I also knew a little bit something about that Y chromosome, mm -hmm. and it's for agility, right? It's not it does not affect the statement, guys. I'm simply saying it, okay? All right, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. But my point of, of emphasizing that is that uh, there is fragility. Okay, and why does that matter? It matters because we 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 drink we drink we, 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 we drink the cooling around male superiority long term. So here's the situation: we got these fellas with all our high expectations for them, without recognizing what that they have particular risks that are associated with just being. Boys. So think about that. At the biological level, there are these forces of fragility, but at the social and expectational level, that there are expectations we have of them that they have more difficulty in a, in a sense responding to. They keep them on a pedestal without scaffolding support. <laughs> so that's why I am especially interested in the experiences of boys, irrespective of race and ethnicity. I just think that because the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the seniority status placed on malehood goes back so many centuries, people are dealing with the reality as well. What does it mean in, um, in um, the current situation? Okay, so another way that I, I thought about this, but quickly I'll do this, again, that feeds into why folks did over three or four hundred publications, is that we do, that we just look at the vulnerability issue. That we can see that, yes, there are people who are high risk with low supports, and yes, there are people with low risk and high supports, and guess what? Another 300 publications. We compare these two, we do it all the time. And guess what? We find lots of P less than 0.001 findings. I mean, you know, really? You know, what surprises there? There is a low hanging fruit that I think is important for us to now look to contribute to this diversity and inclusion conversation in a very positive way. There are youngsters who may be low risk, but psychologically, they don't experience anything but a sense of low protection, right? Then you have kids here, so yes, in terms of my clinical colleagues, they know this, they've experienced trauma, they live under conditions of high risk, but they also have been able to identify, utilize, right, sources of support. This is low hanging fruit. We can understand that so even minimal supports that are needed here, even under conditions of high risk, to keep them resilient and thriving. These youngsters are important here as low-hanging fruit uh, because 
number one, you know, they don't, but they're, they're important because they don't make a lot of noise until they cross over the line. In the sense of, you know, this kid loses his girlfriend, his parents get a divorce or whatever. So suddenly they may live in a low risk situation, but their low risk protective factor presence status becomes even much more, if you will, uh, absent what is needed for psychological stability or equality. It is not, it's not, you can do the research, it is not surprising that, I mean, heck, your former president, now name names, you can put him in a category. Certainly individuals who, uh, certainly in, in terms of, you look at his library, in, in terms of even looking at folks who were the Columbine shooters and other, uh, other uh, individuals after that, and very, very often they fit this category. So just a knowledge building perspective, there is diversity, right? So we can only think, of it, think about it in limited terms. It uh, undermines our ability to make a difference. So what I can say in terms of even this representation of PBES as a more manageable way of understanding what we can do in terms of how we think and interpret findings is that there's this other way of thinking about progress of kids and how we can support them. And the fact that they've got to be supported differently because they are different, right? The following thing. Okay, so the bottom line is that even as we consider, oops, sorry, I'm a little excited here. Even when we consider PVS, we've got to consider the context. And I would say 400 years from 1619 to now, there have been a lot of things that have happened uh, that have not been included in our programs of research. And we forget the context, we limit ourselves. We limit ourselves in terms of being able to understand the source of uh, diversity and therefore uh, the importance of inclusion and importance of having a programming that makes sense for all kids. So very quickly, what I want to say here is that um, done a lot of programming ourselves uh, that demonstrate wedges, you know, what you do in terms of interventions to make a difference. Uh, one of the things that we've done, uh, some of the things we've done here, one of the is uh, it, it takes a lot of money and work. So you've got to do uh, collaborations. One is a collaboration between the National Organization of Disability and uh, university, uh, university uh, context and also the school system. What we're able to do is take uh, special ed kids, special ed youngsters who have an uh, IEP, they have an extra, extra difficult time. Yeah. They very often are problematized and you know, done in by their peers and also by the school system. So we had a collaboration with these three organizations we were able to bring high school uh, special education students who were functioning on a fourth, fifth grade level. And uh, by the time they finished in three years, you know, we had number one, number one, a triple the graduation rate, and we had kids going local training, et cetera. But you have to basically do things that make sense to them. We took them out of the top environment or the high school. We put them on Penn's campus. We trained, we contextualized our teachers. And uh, we gave them opportunities to work and get feedback about their own identity as having efficacy to make a huge difference. Um, right, one of the things we're doing um, now is uh, working um, all through the center for body uh, system first. Uh, we also were able to uh, collaborate with the foundation that had money available and for a um, for 20, 23 high schools in the Northeast. Um, well, we uh, were able to handle for kids who um, uh, were within one standard deviation of the poverty line. And these are high school, high school students. And we, uh, we have kids who were 80 students and impoverished, and kids who were 80 students. But we did, it needed money. Adolescents are expensive. You know that. So if kids need money to put a focus on the task at hand, well, then you give them money, but they have to have an outcome. What we did was to the AD students, we said, we keep your AD grades and we'll give you a spike every month. For mm -hmm. the CD students, you know, um, you need to come to school and you need to at least maintain that, if not improve. And what we were able to do is to see CDs, we need the CD students also a new identity. The AD students, we call them star scholars, I'm full of that academic scholars, scholars and academic resilience. And the city students, we call them the dish stop, and we call the child. 
Okay. So, uh, we gave them the identity and help information providers. We taught the, these students not to have their identified with their schools or with, uh, with uh, English and had bad experiences, but we taught them to be helpless students in their communities, in their families. And that new identity was enough to give them the empty impetus that they need to re engage with school. So we had CD students that suddenly became AD students, right? But you have to take the perspective of the other. What are the needs in terms of risk or challenges that are, if you are significant enough that you can impact to get the outcome of all and great functionality? Okay, and then um, we're also doing work with the police department. Uh, now um, we are uh, youth and uh, male youth and law enforcement officers, you know. Uh, that's a pretty uh, difficult situation. So we're using an artificial intelligence, the computational approach, um, in the collaboration with the uh, police department, and uh, we're trying to determine whether or not police officers uh, responsive to young people might be fine by what they hear. It's a very different approach. I'm excited about that. In addition to that, um, let's see how am I doing this scar. Uh, we're working with, in, in the interest of clinic therapy, I'm working with my son who is at the EdTech program, a, a EdTech company, and we're using hip hop. We're using turn-taking technology and a curriculum, a standard slang curriculum, uh, to uh, use as a uh, as they sort of draw for students to learn STEM. Turntabling and hip hop is nothing but all, uh, music and science, I think from music and uh, math. I'm starting to rush, so sorry about it. I'm going to slow down. Be five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to see if I can play this one. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, I don't have sound. Okay. Uh, well, if you click more, click more. Like the more. top, the three dots. What's this now? Right. So oh, like more. But with this? Oh, no. What do I do? Computer. computer. I'd like you to hear this because this principal, I think he must have been an early DJ himself. So. <laughs> more, and then it'll say new sound, shared computer sound, all the way third up from the back home. I'd like you to hear this nice. because this principal, I think he must have been an early DJ oh, himself. Sure. <laughs>
something like this, but instead just to know uh, and appreciate the humanity and the baseline aspect of humanity that I want to uh, make sure that we all appreciate is that part of our, you know, part of how, part of who we are, you know, this is from day one in terms of infants, you know, that there is a need to show that I can have an impact on the world. And when that is thwarted, you know, it causes dissonance. It causes dissonance. So, given that basic need, it is the responsibility of all of us humans as part of the context to basically, you know, provide support that allow that essence of wanting to make a difference to survive while also being aware of the outside world and our need to adjust what we do and how we do it to the outside world. Um, and I, I think for me, is is that basic recognition, and that's our humanity. We come into this world, you know, just a buzz of things, right? You know, and therefore it's the role of socialization uh, just to kind of tailor that a little bit to make you fit in the world. But the problem with history is that the subjugation of certain people was designed not for them to have a sense of efficacy, but for them to serve, you know, um, at the behest of other people, uh, either basic humanity to be ignored. And so I think what you've described here the, you know, the, the, you know, just a documentation of how this was done and support, and those as memories, you know, what those you know positive experiences did in allowing one to feel, you know, efficacious and whole and loved, etc. So when we do science, social science, in a way that denies that basic humanity, you know, because our humanity is based upon, if you will, a power position. And our identity is such that we can't imagine a self without a Gemini. That's a problem. That's a problem. I'm worried about everybody but for different reasons. And so our job is to understand that. And you have to have the history. The way I calculated in terms of, oh, sorry. The way I calculated in terms of, uh, you know, uh, onic knowledge uh, 400 years of under-interrogated, if you will, history, and how it has differentially impacted different communities, is that you think, uh, I mean, you just think about it, maybe just conservatively, just having just two meals a week together where socialization takes place over food. We talk, right? We watch each other. In those, those years, there might have been 44,000 missed opportunities to acknowledge the sheer humanity. It's my rough estimate by the numbers, but who knows who knows what I'm My estimate. I estimate 44,000 opportunities, or just one family. So we think about that intergenerationally connected, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't happen. And so here we are now. So, you know, I don't think we should be concerned about uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, you know, dying. I think it's our job to use history to illustrate why, in fact, for everyone's survival and thriving, we need to go there. And that's why the mirror. That's why the mirror. We need to go there. But we're talking about active efforts not to engage 
not to engage and continue this, uh, you know, pattern of, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of missed opportunities. And then we look at children's responses to these uneven contexts. And we make careers off reporting on that without pointing the finger at ourselves. We know better. We know what good science needs to look like for understanding everybody's humanity, culturally experienced in myriad contexts. We know better. And in fact, as, as social scientists, we've not gone there. You know, uh, we have weaponized our ignorance. Mm -hmm. We have weaponized our ignorance. And it's, it, 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 is, it is volitional. There's nothing accidental about this. So, you know, we're in this place when I am sharing in terms of this little memento, remember this talk and I want you to be as annoyed as I am. It's nicer than saying this. I want you to be as annoyed as I am about this situation because children are taking on the responsibilities of our neglect. They, they work, I mean, I'm focusing on, you know, just the need to take other people's perspective. I'm focusing on the need to, you know, change, if you will, the power negotiation. And people are asking us to do this work with the DEI. It's their power that's asking us to do their job. Mm. And so the answer should be heck no. You know, but uh, that's all I'm saying is that I don't want us to focus on the children anymore. Adolescents, let them grow and be and thrive. We are the problem. When I began this work, you know, 50 years ago, yeah. 50 years ago, uh, there was no literature. We know better now. We know better now. We've got the statistical packages. You know, we can critique, if you will. We have the very linearity assumptions, right, that, is, that are problematic. But we know more now than we knew before. And the fact that we're not doing more is a volitional statement, is a character flaw that needs to be interrogated, addressed in our and we need to take responsibility for it. So, you know, kids are fine. It's the adults we have to fix. Thank you.